Very good to see everyone here this morning. If you would open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6 will be here in just a moment. We want to begin by considering this. Have you ever been in such a bad situation you cannot see any possible way of getting out of it? Maybe it was a financial struggle in your life where either your income stopped and so the bills piled up, maybe the debt that you have, house payment doesn't get paid, and your luck at finding more employment or more income just doesn't seem to be working out. And so you feel like, I don't know how there's any way I'm ever going to get through this. Maybe it's a health issue that you have. Maybe it's something that's ongoing through life and you reach a point where you think, well, I'm just going to have to deal with this. I'm going to have to live with this. I don't see any way out of it at all. Or maybe it's a spiritual struggle that you faced and you feel like you've gone so far down that path of sin and unrighteousness that there's no hope for you. That you are always going to be entangled by the devil and sin and you're going to just lose your soul. And when people hit that point, it's a sad condition as they turn their heart away from the Lord. But you know, the Bible be, reveals that what seems to be impossible to us, to men, is completely and totally within the power of God. And we have to learn to trust in Him and to believe in His power. We have to live in a way that we have confidence that He is with us because He loves us. To this end, we want to study out of 2 Kings chapter 6 an account in the life of Elisha the prophet. As we think about this lesson, we're thinking about Elisha's deliverance. And what we want to do is just begin by reading 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 down through 23. We'll back up and discuss what is happening here, and then we will look at some lessons we can draw from it. So 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servant, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, Go and see where he is that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, Surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was a great army, or there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Now Elisha said to them, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. So it was when they had come to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. 
And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and there they were inside Samaria. Now when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? But he answered, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your, with your sword and your bow? Set your food and water, or set food and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Then he prepared a great feast for them, and after they ate and drank, he sent them away, and they went to their master. So the bands of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. So at the beginning of that account, it tells us that the king of Syria was making war against Israel. And the idea is that he's sending these raiding parties into the land of Israel. There are two scenarios that have been proposed as to exactly what it is that they are doing and then how it is that the king reacts when he's warned about this. One of them is given in a commentary on the Old Testament by Kyle and Dalich, and they say that Israel was taking defensive positions, that the prophet would warn them that the Syrians are going to come in, they're going to hit this village, they're going to hit that town, and so don't pass by it. You need to stay there and defend it so that it is not vulnerable to the Syrian troops. Another theory that is put forward is by Alfred Edersheim in his comments in Bible history. He says that the Syrians were attempting to actually kidnap Jehoram, the king of Israel. And what he bases that on is Josephus, the Jewish, Jewish historian, said that that's what the Syrians were doing. Now, whether Josephus was accurate in that or not, we don't fully know. But in that case, what he's saying is that if the king planned to go out and to travel and perhaps hunt in a particular area, that the Syrians evidently had a spy among the Israelites and they would try to go there in order to kidnap the king. And so he would avoid that place. He wouldn't go where the Syrians were going to show up. But whether it's one or the other, the fact of the matter is the Syrians had a plan they were making to go out and to attack in some way. But the prophet of God, Elisha, tells the king of Israel, this is where they're going to be. And so their plans are frustrated. They're thwarted in the attempt to make the attack whatever kind of attack that may have been. And so the king of Syria suspects that someone within his council, within his officers that would have talked to him about these plans and about the war that they were making against Israel, that someone among them was a spy. And of course, the spy answer, or rather the, one of his members of his council answers and said, well, none of us are a spy, my lord. But Elisha the prophet who is in Israel, he tells the king of Israel even the words you speak in your bedroom. In other words, in your most private place, he knows what you say. And he's passing that along. And that's why we can't capture the king of Israel or we can't raid these cities. And so it may be that this has happened long enough because it says it didn't happen just once or twice, but this is going on again and again and again. And maybe word got around that Elisha, the prophet, is the one who is letting all this be known. Or maybe it is that the Syrians did have a spy in Israel, close to the king, who is telling them, hey, Elisha is telling everything that you guys are doing. He's telling them all of your plans. Well, then the king decides, okay, if Elisha the prophet is the one who's telling the king what's happening, then I need to snatch him. I need to go get him so he can't tell the king anymore. So he asks, well, where is he? Find out where he is. The word comes back, well, he is in Dothan in verse 13. Now, Dothan is a city or was a city on the top of a hill. And it was surrounded by other hills. It was described almost like an amphitheater that you have the city of Dothan that is kind of there in the middle and it's surrounded by them and then to the north it is open. But there are these other hills that are there. So it's a relatively well protected or well defensible position because they could see people who are coming who crest those other hills before they get up to them and then they would have to come up the hill to attack that city. And it says that the Syrian king, Ben-Hadad at this time, that he sent horses and chariots there 
and a great army. So it's not a few people. It's not like he's sending a raiding party of three or four or half dozen or even a dozen, but he sends this great army up there. And maybe this is because he knows about the reputation of Elisha. Maybe it is because of what happened back in chapter 5 when Naaman the leper was healed of his leprosy. He knows there's great power and God is with him. And so he's being abundantly cautious here in sending this great army to try to capture the prophet of God. So they come up and they surround the city at night. In other words, they come in, of course, by stealth. When the servant awakens that next day and he goes out and he sees this great army around them, he begins to panic. Alas, my master, what shall we do? And what we see in this unfolding here is that God was with his prophet. The servant is very nervous about it. But Elisha makes this declaration in verse 16, do not fear those who are with us do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Elisha is confident. He's not upset. He's not worried. He's not troubled about this whatsoever. And he's trying to calm the fears of his servant here. He's trying to tell him everything's going to be okay. So Elisha then prays, it says in verse 17, that the Lord would open the eyes of his servant. His servant's eyes were open. And he sees the mountain around them full, it says, of horses and chariots of fire. They were all around them. In other words, the idea is they vastly outnumber that great army of chariots and horses that the Syrians had sent there. And so everything was going to be okay. Well, the next thing we see Elisha pray about in verse 18 is that the Syrian soldiers would be struck with blindness. And there's debate about what type of blindness. Is this blindness as though they can't see anything and everything goes dark? Or is this blindness where they just can't see what's happening as they're being led away? In other words, they go to Samaria. They would not have gone there voluntarily, but they're still on their horses. They still have their chariots. And they have to pass along the pass. It's about a four-hour trip between Dothan and the city of Samaria. And they have to be walked right in there. And so maybe they can still see, but they can't see. But whichever way that it is, he prays for them to be struck blind, and they are blind. And then Elisha essentially walks them into the city of Samaria, which would have been a stronghold of Israel. Well, Elisha then prays that their eyes would be opened. And they're shocked, they're surprised to find themselves inside the city of Samaria. The king asked. The king's very excited. You can imagine how he is that all these raiding parties have been coming into his land. He's been trying to either avoid them or stop them from coming into the land. And then all of a sudden, here's a huge contingent of that army right there in his city. He has the power then and there, no doubt with many troops that are with him, to attack them and to kill them, to slaughter them, and basically put an end to this war. So should I kill them? Should I kill them? And Elisha says, no, don't kill them. Give them food. Sit them down and treat them well. And then they sent them home to Samaria, or to Syria rather. And it says in the end of verse 23, the bands of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. That miracle and that mercy had its effect. So they weren't raiding anymore. Let's look at some lessons out of this. The first one, we go to Psalm 34. Psalm 34, as we think about what unfolded with Elisha, the Syrians, and the others who are mentioned there. In Psalm 34, the first thing we want to note is that angels are all around us. In Psalm 34, verse 7, it says, The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear Him and delivers them. Have you ever thought about the fact that we are never alone? Sometimes we feel alone. Sometimes we feel like we are all by ourselves. When Elisha's servant woke up that morning and he walked out and he saw the Syrian army surrounding the city of Dothan, he thought it's just us against them. 
whether it's just him and Elisha or him and others who are in the city, they're outnumbered. You have this armed force that's facing them. And he's thinking, we're, we're in trouble here. He was thinking, we're alone. The army of Israel is up there in Samaria or they're camped somewhere else. We don't have an army with us. So he's thinking, we're alone here. But of course, his eyes were open to see a host of angels that filled the mountain around them. You know, there are times in the Bible where we read about the angels, if you will, piercing the veil between the spiritual world and the physical world, where they cross over from one to the other. You think about Abraham in Genesis 18, Genesis 19. When he was there, the Lord came to him to tell him, I'm going to destroy Sodom. And it says that three people were there. And it talks about how two of them then went on to the city of Sodom in Genesis chapter 19, verse 1. And it says that these two were angels. And that Lot saw them out there. Lot brought them into his house. He saw them as men, but they were angels. So the angels appeared to them at that point. You remember how that in Acts chapter 12, when Peter was in jail, and it tells us that as he was in jail and he was asleep there, that an angel came in and struck him to wake him up and told him to get ready and get out of here, and he followed the angel out. And then the angel disappeared from him. So there are many accounts in the Bible where it talks about angels appearing and being with and being around the people of God. So you think about these angels and their use and their purpose in God's plan. If you go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. And read with me here verses 13 and 14. Hebrews 1, 13 and 14. He says, But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And what he's talking about is the superiority of Christ above the angels. And he's quoting and saying that he did not say this to the angels, but he's saying it to his son who would sit at his right hand and make his enemies his footstool. But notice what he says in verse 14. Are they, referring to angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Now today, we don't have angels literally walking around among us. But they are working in God's providence to bring about His will. And as they are working in His providence, on our behalf, we understand that we can live a life of confidence. If you go to Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews 13, and as the writer is closing out the book, he mentions this in Hebrews 13 verse 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? We have no need to fear. Just as much as the angels were around Elisha and his servant, the angels are around us today, right now. We can't see them, but they're here. They are among us. They're watching us. They're working on God's behalf to bless and benefit His children. I can't explain how all of that works. I just know that that is what the Bible reveals. And in 2 Kings chapter 6, it pulls back that veil between this realm and the other and shows us there is a mighty host of God's angels all around us. Another thing we want to notice is the idea of using spiritual weapons. If you'll go to 2 Corinthians... 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 3, it says this. 
For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You think back to what unfolded in 2 Kings chapter 6 and how Elisha and his servant are staying there and they're looking at this great army. They have swords and spears and shields and some of them are mounted on horses and others that are in chariots. And if you know anything about ancient warfare, the horse gave a huge advantage to anyone on the ground. The great power of that animal going into battle. And so here they are facing this overwhelming force. And of course, it made his servant very nervous. But what is it that Elisha did? If you go back to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. And notice again how the prophet reacted to this. 2 Kings chapter 6 verse 17. Elisha prayed, Lord, I pray, open the eyes of that he may see. In verse 18, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. So in one prayer, he's really asking to give my servant evidence so that his faith is strong. So it's defensive in a sense, if you will, faith building in a sense. But then he asked that the Syrian army would be struck blind. So they're rendered incapable of attacking them. They're weakened in this. And so this is, again, a protective measure that he's taking. But notice, it's prayer. Elisha doesn't say, let's run into the armory here in Dothan and let's grab our weapons and we'll go out here and we'll have at it with these guys. He goes to God in prayer. He employs, if you will, spiritual weapons as his manner of protection and deliverance in Ephesians chapter 6 Ephesians chapter 6 remember that the Apostle Paul lists out the armor of God there in Ephesians 6 beginning in verse 10 let's read down through 18 finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all power and supplication of the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Put on this armor of God, he says. That belt of truth, that breastplate of righteousness, having sandals on your feet of the gospel of preparation to give you strong standing. Have a shield of faith and a helmet of salvation and take that sword of the Spirit. Use these things in your battle against Satan. They're going to help you. They're going to deliver you. They're going to protect you. And did you notice how when Paul rounded out that list that he says, pray always, you need that armor. You need the sword, but you need to be praying because prayer is a powerful weapon. We, as children of God, have access to. We have an audience with, if you will, the creator of the universe. Think about that. We can at any time Address God who created all things and He will hear. And He listens. And He loves us. And He cares about us. And He wants what's good for us. And He has a host of angels at His disposal. 
We have a Savior who defeated death and the devil. And the Lord will not hold back anything that is right and good for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, remember what it says here? 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. The God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You know, Elisha's servant was filled with fear when he was surrounded. When the enemy was all around, when the enemy was threatening, he was very disturbed about that. And he could not see a way of escape. But Elisha, through prayer, brought about that way of escape. Sometimes when we are being pressed by the enemy, sometimes when we're surrounded, so to speak, and we're being intimidated or we are being tempted, as Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 10, and we just feel that pressure and we can't see the way of escape, the thing to do is to pray. Pray and that way of escape will be opened up. Prayer is a powerful weapon against our adversary. We need to be using it. That is part of our spiritual defense, part of our armor, part of the things God has given us and equipped us with so that we can stand strong and be faithful and not be overcome by our enemy. Another thing that we want to notice is that we need to have mercy on our enemies. Remember when that Syrian army was taken into Samaria and the king is saying, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? And Elisha says, no, feed them. Let's send them home. Have mercy on them. Don't slaughter them. Don't kill them. Show kindness to them. And so that helped to stop the raids into Israel. If you go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. You remember the writing of Paul here beginning in verse 17. Romans 12, 17. He says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The Bible tells us that when we have an enemy, we're not to retaliate against them. We're not to lash out toward them. But as he says here, do a good deed. If your enemy's hungry, give him something to eat. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And you will heap coals of fire on his head. He won't know what to do with that very often. And maybe it is that you'll stop that enemy's active opposition because they see that you are genuinely a good and decent person. And you truly care about what's best for them, not just yourself. But then also in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus addressed this issue beginning in verse 43. Matthew 5, verse 43, He said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For He makes His Son rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. You know, God is generous and kind to those who are evil as well as to those who are good. 
We need to respond in kindness. Now, this is not easy. When he says to pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, our normal and natural reaction, I say natural in the sense that this is the way the world is, this is what we're shown to do, it's in the movies, right? Always that person who's wronged and they get their vengeance on that bad person that we want to react in anger and wrath and bitterness toward them. But the Lord says, you need to pray for them. You need to do good to them. That's hard. But if we do that, we'll be like our Father who is in heaven. And you know what might happen? Might? We might lead them to the Lord. They see our example. They see our faith. They see our commitment. If you go to Romans chapter 5, Romans 5, as we think about showing mercy on our enemies, we want to be reminded that we have been shown mercy, though we are the enemies of Christ. In Romans chapter 5, verse 6, For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. You know what? We ought to be humbled to realize that mercy that's been extended to us, that even though we deserve the wrath of God, we deserve that. We deserve every one of us to be struck down and cast off into hell forever. That's what we deserve. But in spite of that, we've been shown grace. God has been merciful to us. He's been patient with us and He's given us opportunity after opportunity to come to Him and to live for Him, to be close to Him and to have that hope of everlasting life. Our enemies may deserve wrath. They may deserve to be destroyed in their life. That may be true. There are Sometimes that people are just evil, they're just mean, they're just hateful, and they do us real harm. And they deserve wrath. But we deserve wrath. So we need to show them kindness and mercy. It's not our place to bring that wrath upon them. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Leave it in the Lord's hands. He will take care of that. If you will, open your Bible, or to your hymn books rather, to 719. 719. You know, when the enemy is bearing down on us, and escape seems impossible. We need to remember the power of the Lord. We need to remember that He's working for us. And therefore, those who are with us are more than those who are with Him, our adversary. And so we can live in confidence. This morning, if you're a child of God, I have to ask you, are you living in fear? Are you living in a way that you don't see, you don't understand that God is with you and God is on your side? Has the devil been able to get to your mind and to your heart and to cause you to doubt? Well, it's time to repent of that. It's time to open your eyes and turn to the Lord. You've been struggling with sin. Satan has led you down that path. It's time for you to find that way of escape that the Lord is offering to you this morning. Confess it to Him. Repent and be restored.
And anyone who is not a child of God, anyone who has not believed in Jesus as the Christ or confessed that, repented of your sins, if you've not been baptized to have your sins washed away, you've not obeyed the Gospel, then you stand condemned and you stand as an enemy of God. And all enemies of God in the end are going to be defeated and they are going to suffer eternally. Right now is your opportunity to turn to the Lord. He has allowed you in His providence to be here in His presence that you may, be have, you may have your sins remitted and taken away. That you may live a life of great faith and confidence knowing that He is with you and on your side. So won't you turn to Him and humble yourself and accept the mercy that He's extending to you now. If you have a need to respond, we invite you to come forward while we stand and sing.